Hi guys, I am back with the next few chapters of The Unteachables. Um, today we're going to start with chapter 19, Parker Elias. Grams has a lot of life experience, being super old and all that. For example, she tells me that when she was first dating my grandfather back in Israel, there was this other girl who was trying to steal him away while Grams was doing her military service. So Grams challenged this girl to an arm wrestling match. And the prize was Grandpa. I peer over at her in the passenger seat of the pickup. What if you lost? I was loading supply trucks, kiddo. I was strong as an ox. As much as I love Grams, I'm not so sure I believe this story. The last time she explained how she got rid of the girl who moved in on Grandpa, she said she backed over her Vespa with a Jeep. Grams tells the same stories because she doesn't remember telling them last time and the time before that. Some people might find that annoying. To me, it just means that we've always got something new and interesting to talk about while I'm driving her around. I just wish she could remember my name. The reason the subject comes up, dating and boyfriends, I mean, is that there's a rumor that Miss Fountain and Jake Terranova are going out. Our class thinks it's because Jake has kind of adopted SCS8. Jake, that's what he told us to call him. Even the employees at the dealership call him Mr. Terranova, but to us, he's Jake. Except Ribbit, he always uses Mr. when he talks to Jake which is almost never. Jake may be hitting it off with Miss Fountain, but he isn't getting very far with Mr. Kermit. Here's how it usually goes down. Jake shows up in room 117 to invite us to Terra Nova Motors so the mechanics can show us how the windshield wiper works or how a battery supplies, or how a battery supplies power to the starter. He has to come in person because Mr. Kermit's phone is so old that it would probably explode if it ever received a text. Meanwhile, Miss Fountain randomly walks in from 115. Oh, what a surprise, Mr. Terranova's here. She calls him Mr. Terranova too. We're not fooled, he calls her Emma. From there, something always happens to connect our two classes. Maybe Vladimir starts squeaking because he hears Aldo's voice and won't shut up until Aldo goes over there. Or the seventh graders are just about to have circle time and we get in on that. Jake loves circle time and whenever it's his turn to compliment someone, he always picks Miss Fountain. Mateo is confused. I thought Jake chose us because he wants to make up for the cheating scandal, not because of Miss Fountain. That's just his excuse, Barnston puts in wisely. Do you think it's the car? Jake rolls this really snazzy Porsche convertible. That's got to be a lot of fun to drive. Of course it's not the car, Kiana retorts angrily. Miss Fountain isn't that kind of person. She wants a relationship. I don't understand how Kiana can know something like that. But whatever the reason, life is definitely better since, since Jake started hanging around. Everybody loves him, even Aldo, and Aldo hates everybody. Jake's more like another kid than an adult, but a kid who has a dream life with tons of money and no adults telling him what to do. He talks to me about cars, to Barnstorm about sports, and to Mateo about Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. He talks to Elaine, I guess car dealers don't worry about being headbutted downstairs or tossed into garbage dumpsters. He talks to Kiana about practically everything. He, talk, he asks Raheem's opinion on the art for the new ads for Terra Nova Motors, and Raheem never so much as yawns when he's around. The only person Jake can't schmooze is Mr. Kermit. Our teacher isn't quite mean to him. Most of the time, he just ignores Jake the way he used to ignore us. When Mr. Kermit's old car breaks down, he has to get it towed all the way across town, even though Jake offers to fix it for free. Ribbit would rather pay a lot of money than accept a favor from his old enemy. Whatever the reason, Jake has started hanging around. 
The trips to Terra Nova Motors are amazing. At first, the service staff aren't too thrilled to see Elaine because of what happened with the cookie, but then the, comp but then the compressor for the pneumatic system conks out and Elaine's the only one who can loosen a stripped bolt using a hand wrench. All the mechanics stop what they're doing and applaud. Kid, that was something, the service chief exclaims admiringly. If the list system loses power, can we count on you to pick up cars on your shoulders? It's the first time I've ever seen Elaine blush. I'll bet the, I bet the kid she headbutted down the stairs wouldn't think it's so funny that an eighth grade girl is stronger than a shop full of adult mechanics. At first, the mechanics just talk a lot and show us stuff, but pretty soon we're doing real work. Jake guides my hand as I fit a new hose into the radiator of a Jeep Cherokee. As I set the ring to seal the connection, it just feels right. Somehow, I know that hose isn't gonna leak. The boss reaches in and tests my handiwork. Perfect, not so tight that the rubber might split. Nice job, Parker. It's weird. I open a book and the letters are jumbled together into an unbreakable code. But I look at a car engine and it all makes sense. Even if the tires still say, ready, go, supposed to be good year. Mr. Kermit's watching me and he's almost smiling. I think I can count on a puffy tail being added to my line of the chart today. Terra Nova Motors isn't the only place we're doing real work. It's happening in 117 too. Mr. Kermit is teaching stuff, math, science, English. We have our first test of the year, social studies, and Mr. Kermit even grades it. When we get to class the next day, our papers are face down on our desks. Aldo flips his over. D? Ribbit never gave tests before and now he's throwing D's around? Barnstorm laughs in his face. It isn't Ribbit's fault you're stupid. He examines his own papers. The word incomplete is written across the top. What? He complains. At least I got a grade, Aldo tells him. I miss the old rivet, Barnstone complains. Yeah, Aldo agrees. This is way too much education. I get an incomplete too, mostly because I finished only seven of the 20 questions, but I blink and seven check marks parade down the page which means whatever I did, I aced. I still got an incomplete, but not incomplete dumb, just incomplete, incomplete slow. It stinks to fail, whatever the reason. But I disagree with Aldo and Barnsum that our class was better before. We'll be in high school next year. Will they have an SCS 9 for us, followed by SCS 10, SCS 11, and SCS 12? And then what? Sooner or later, something has to change. It might as well start now. As I take my seat, I catch a glimpse of the test paper on Elaine's desk. I shake my head. I must be reading it wrong. That's what I do. On the other hand, how do you scramble a single letter? If I didn't know better, I'd swear Elaine, rhymes with pain, just pulled an A. Chapter 20, Jake Terranova. As I cruise along River Street with the top down, and red, the red brick of Greenwich Middle School heaves into view. That place used to be a bad memory. I was never much of a student, but middle school was a really tough time. I was lucky to get away with a suspension over the cheating thing. If my dad hadn't belonged to the same college fraternity as a couple of the school board members, I probably would have been expelled. It was that close. Now though, Greenwich Middle School means Emma. She's the best thing that's happened that's ever happened to me. Just the thought that she's somewhere inside of the building puts a smile on my face. The smile disappears when I recognize the figure standing at the entrance of the driveway, glancing impatiently at his watch. Mr. Kermit, my old teacher, the man who has every reason to drink from the haterade where I'm concerned. Back in seventh grade, I was so happy not to be expelled that there wasn't another thought in my head it never crossed my mind that the episode might cause problems for my teacher. Why would it? Mr. Kermit was completely innocent. 
who knew that better than the guy who was completely guilty. But that's only the half of it. According to Emma, Mr. Kermit's life crashed after that. His reputation was shot. His engagement to Emma's mom fell apart and he got totally burned out professionally. Honestly, I had no clue until Emma showed me the article about the Vuvuzelas. The fact that the scandal still sticks to Mr. Kermit after all these years is nuts. Not that I ever had the power to change anything. I was a middle school kid in big trouble. I followed my parents' instructions to the letter. Basically, shut up and keep your nose clean. Now that I know the extent of it, I'd do anything to make things right. The problem is it's too late. Sure, Mr. Kermit isn't letting me, is letting me help with this class of unteachables, and I'm getting along great with the kids, but as for the teacher himself, no dice. I check the clock on my Porsche's high-tech dashboard. It's only 2 p.m. Why is Mr. Kermit in, why isn't Mr. Kermit in school? I pull alongside him and wave. Mr. Kermit scowls at me with what Mateo calls the Squidward Grinch face. That kid's pretty weird, but he's usually spot on. He's nicknamed me Han Solo because both of us are lovable scoundrels. Maybe I walked away from the cheating scandal with a slap on the wrist, but lately it's come back to haunt me in all sorts of ways. Everything okay, Mr. Kermit? I ask. My taxi is late. Right, his car is in the shop. I volunteered to fix it, no charge, but he wasn't having any of that. To say he's stubborn as a mule is an insult to mules. Hop in, I invite. I'll give you a ride wherever you need to go. No thanks, he replies formally. I've been waiting 40 minutes for this taxi. It'll be here any second. It's not coming, I persist. Did you try Uber? He looks blank. I remember that Mr. Kermit has a flip phone that's probably as old as his car. There are smartphones and dumb phones. His is a rock. I unlock the passenger door. Mr. Kermit, please, let me give you a lift. When he reluctantly gets in and announces his destination, I nearly choke. He's going to pick up his car from Kingston's Auto Works. Are you serious? You took your car 15 miles out of town just to avoid my offer to fix it for free? His response is a heavy dose of the Squidward Grinch face. I don't wanna owe you anything. You wouldn't owe me anything. I'm practically whining now. I would have been happy to do it. He's sarcastic. Well, so long as you're happy. That's not what I meant and you know it. I enjoy doing favors for friends. Mr. Kermit doesn't like that. So I adjust my word choice. For people I know, you used to be my teacher. I remember. This is it, my chance to clear the air and apologize, but as soon as the thought pops into my head, I know he won't let me. Better to shut up about it. Maybe as the two of us spend more time together, I'll get another chance. And maybe the moon will fall out of the sky. When the Porsche reaches Kingston's Auto Works, Mr. Kermit takes out his wallet and tries to pay me for the gas. When I won't accept it, he stuffs a $20 bill into the glove compartment and gets out, not bothering to say thank you. I get out too and receive a generous helping of Squidward Grinch face. I can handle it from here, he assures me. I'm going in with you, I insist. I don't want you to get ripped off. These guys are all crooks, including you, Mr. Kermit inquires in innocently. I run a totally honest shop, but still I feel my cheeks flush. An old clunker like yours, the parts probably have to come from the third world. Who knows what they'll try to charge you for them? It must make an impression, because Mr. Kermit actually allows me to follow him inside. The place is a dump. You could probably catch plague just standing there, breathing the air. The mechanic behind the counter instantly recognizes me. Hey, you're Jake Terranova. What are you doing here? My very good friend is picking up his car, I reply pointedly. I want to make sure he gets a fair deal. We barely know each other, Mr. Kermit sets the record straight. The mechanic picks up a clipboard. Which car? The Coco nerd, the teacher tells him. The what? Mr. Kermit flushes. It's a Chrysler Concord, 1992. 
One of my students calls it that. He's different. I snap my fingers. Parker, right? What's up with that kid? He's got a lot of mechanical ability. But ask him to read the name of a part, off of a part, and it comes out pure gobbledygook. It's not gobbledygook, he says, insulted on Parker's behalf. The boy has a perception problem. He sees all the letters, but his mind rearranges them. Concord, to Coco Nerd. Like an anagram, the mechanic butts in. You should meet my boss. He's an anagram maniac. You look at a word, and to you it's just a jumble, but he can pick it out in a heartbeat. Poor Parker, the kid's got real potential. How's he ever gonna pass an engineering exam if he can't read the questions? All right, where's the car? Car's not ready, the mechanic tells us. There's a part coming from the Bahamas and it's held up in customs. Instead of getting mad, Mr. Kermit acts like he's in a completely different world. Anagrams, he repeats slowly. He grabs my arm, let's go. You have to stick up for yourself. I say sternly. I turn to the mechanic. Is this what you call service? If I ran my shop this way, I'd be out of business in a week. How's the part coming from the Bahamas? By manatee? It doesn't matter, Mr. Kermit insists. Take me to the bookstore. The bookstore? You don't need books. You need wheels. Back in the Porsche, he explains what all of this is about. Parker's mind turns text into anagrams. Yeah, so... So anagrams are something you can get good at, like any other puzzle. I stare at him. Solving anagrams can teach you to read? Mr. Kermit shakes his head. Of course not. Parker needs a reading specialist. If I was half a teacher, I would have gotten him one weeks ago. I'm confused. So where do the anagrams fit in? The kid's reading has been a disaster for so long that he looks at it like it's magic something he'll never be able to master. But solving anagrams will show him it can be done. So when I get him the help he needs, he'll believe it can work. Can you get him the help he needs? I ask. The district has reading specialists, he explains. Nobody sends them to SCS8 because they consider my students a lost cause. That ends now. He glares at me. The bookstore. I step on the gas and the Porsche surges forward. It's amazing how Mr. Kermit's whole face changes when he's talking about the kids in his class. He becomes a totally different person, younger, more alive. He's the teacher I remember from all those years ago. At the bookstore, he's a whirlwind, stacking up an armload of anagram puzzle books tall enough for him to hold in place with his chin. By this time, school is out, so he demands to be taken to Parker's house. Can't you just wait to see him tomorrow morning? I want to strike while the iron is hot. The Elias family lives just outside the Greenwich city limits on a small farm that was designed to keep sports cars out. The long driveway is really just a pair of ruts worn into the unpaved ground by vehicles much higher and wider than the Porsche. I can actually feel the weeds brushing the low undercarriage as we jounce along. Eventually, we come to a low wood frame home next to a shed amid fields of tall corn. No sign of life from the house. I cut the engine. Should I honk? Let's give it a while, Mr. Kermit decides. After about 15 minutes, Parker comes roaring up the driveway, his famous grandmother in the passenger seat of the pickup. I know a moment of agony as the kid pulls far too close behind the parked convertible. Parker is pretty bewildered to see his teacher rushing across the front lawn, toting a pile of books he can barely see over. The grandmother spies me standing by my car. I know you, she calls. You're jumping Jake Terranova. That's right, ma'am. Pleased to meet you. She beams. I see you on television. You'll jump through hoops to provide fast relief from painful athlete's foot fungus. That's not me, I tell her. I'll get you a great deal on a newer used vehicle. She looks at me like I'm feeble-minded. Why would I need that? I've got my grandson to drive me around. Mr. Kermit is having an animated conversation with Parker, holding up anagram books and, talk, and talking a blue streak. They're well into it when a small tractor chugs out of the field and an older, taller version of Parker hops off and joins the group. 
Parker's dad is surprised that a teacher would make house calls, but as Mr. Kermit explains his plan, the man looks impressed and smiles with appreciation. The contrast isn't lost on me. Mr. Elias' gratitude for a teacher who's willing to move heaven and earth to help a student versus my folks all those years ago. They rescued their son, and I'm thankful, but in the process, they hung the teacher out to dry. Mr. Kermit deserved better. I hope someday I'll get the chance to make it up to him. Chapter 21, Kiana Rubini. No bikini aura that has nothing to do with bathing suits. It's an anagram of my name. Mr. Kermit has me working with Parker on anagrams to improve his reading. Parker's getting pretty good, but for me, it's just fun. It's amazing the stuff you can come up with. For example, Zachary Kermit can be scrambled into crazy tram hike or Aldo Brath into full the barf. Even Aldo laughs at that one, and he doesn't strike me as someone with a great sense of humor, especially about himself. He looks pretty different when he smiles, like his face is going along with all that red hair instead of fighting against it. Or maybe Aldo decides to be mellow because he doesn't have a lot of a choice. His reading partner's Elaine. It's one thing to kick a locker, a locker can't headbutt you down a flight of stairs, or any other of Elaine's greatest hits like chucking a fire extinguisher at your face or giving you a new ear piercing with a fishing hook. Ouch. To everybody's surprise, Elaine turns out to be kind of a serious student, which nobody noticed before since they're too busy being terrified of her. Mr. Kermit assigns them where the red fern grows and Elaine is totally into it. So Aldo has to read it too, even though he claims the last book he finished was Hop on Pop. The other reading group is Barnston, Mateo, and Rahim. This works because Mateo never shuts up, which keeps Rahim from falling asleep. Actually, Rahim is more awake lately anyway. Mr. Kermit talked with stepdad, who agreed to move his rock band's nighttime rehearsals to an alternate venue. Guess where? An empty storage garage at Terra Nova Motors. Sometimes I join those guys because Parker goes into goes to a reading specialist three days a week. That makes four of us, but it's usually just three because Raheem isn't around as much these days. Mr. Kermit got him accepted as a part-time art student at the community college on the other side of the river. Since he draws all the time anyways, it makes good sense to send him somewhere that's a good thing. It's complicated, but it works. On any given day, Barnstam might have three partners, or two, or just one. It doesn't make that much difference, because the only thing he really cares about is his puffy tails. Like any athlete, Barnstam's competitive. But since he's sidelined from sports, all that competitive energy gets channeled into good bunnies. His parade of puffy tails stretches past the basket of carrots, off the poster, and two-thirds of the way across the wall. He's miles ahead of me in second place. Mostly, that's because he won't cash them in. He's too greedy. Whenever my line of puppy tails reaches the carrots, I redeem them for a reward. Our class has already had two pizza parties, thanks to me. Plus, I lent Aldo a bunch so he could pay off the penalties for some late homework assignments. That was Mr. Kermit's idea. He's using puppy tails to teach us how an economy works. We're free to trade them, spend them, sell them, or lend them. But the lenders have to charge interest. Aldo owes me 10% every week, and he's sinking deeper and deeper into debt. You're a sucker, Barnstone tells me. He's never going to pay you back. It's puffy tails down a sinkhole. He is so, I defend Aldo, and with interest. Using what, Barnstone retorts. He's never earned a single puffy tail. Aldo leaps up. I have two. I just spend mine on fines and stuff. Sit. Elaine rumbles, and Aldo plunks back down onto his chair. Barnson won't let it go. Name one thing you ever did for a puffy tail. Aldo thinks hard. I, I, I changed the bulb in the projector. No, that was Raheem, Mateo puts in. In frustration, Aldo runs his hands through his red hair, which makes it even messier. Big deal, who cares about a bunch of rabbit butts? 
I glare at Barnsome. I have faith in Aldo. Oh yeah? He shoots back. Why? It's a good question. Why would I put my trust in a bad-tempered redhead and a straight D student? Well, part of it's probably because I don't care that much about puffy tails to begin with, but I think the other part might be Vladimir. Eight classes a day make their way through room 115, and that lizard doesn't squeak his head off for any of them. He loves Aldo. Only Aldo. And aren't animals supposed to have instincts about people who are good at heart? I turn on Barnstorm. At least Aldo is not a tight-fisted cheapsteak cheapskate like you. When the year's over and we're in high school, all those puffy tails will be worthless. You can't... Puffy tails will be worthless. You can't take it with you, Elaine adds philosophically. Barnstorm is smug. At least I'll be rich. You're a Ferengi, Mateo tells him. That's a race of aliens from Star Trek. They worship money and profit above all things. Settle down, Mr. Kermit says mildly. We're free to spend or not spend our puffy tails however we choose. That's how a market economy works. As we settle back to work, I can't help thinking about what I said to Barnstorm when the year's over and we're in high school. I'm not going to be in high school with these kids. I'll be gone before the end of the semester. How many times can mom's movie get struck by lightning? But at the moment the words are coming out of my mouth, I meant them. I actually saw myself finishing out the year with this class that I don't belong in, in this school I don't really go to, and in this town where my only connection is the fact that my parents grew up here. Oh man, I've got to get back to LA and fast. All right, that is the end of today. So make sure you are answering the questions. If you're not sure of an answer, go back and listen to it again. Um, if you need any help, send us an email and we will be able to help you. All right, keep working hard. Bye guys.